This is part of the summer series of Saints and Sermons about women by women, brought to you by the Cathedral of the Incarnation in Baltimore, Maryland. Our preacher is the very Reverend Rebecca McLean. Good morning, beloved. As we gather here this summer to celebrate some of the most remarkable and holy women in the Christian fold, the Southern Baptist Convention once again debates the place of women in pastoral roles. The vote this year still leaves the door slightly ajar, but they are closing the ranks and clinging to an unsupported doctrine of complementarianism, stating that God has assigned men, happy Father's Day, <laughs> and women to specific gender roles. It holds to an exclusively male leadership in the church and in the home. How is it that the God of all creation, who spins out stars and galaxies and all the mysteries of the universe for the sport of it, how can the Creator make us in God's image and then impose these kinds of limits? I cannot begin today without a comment on the irony of standing before you to preach the Word of God as expressed through the life of Evelyn Underhill. She was a witness, teacher, prolific writer, mystic, a member of the beloved community, and a dynamic force of nature who did not let her gender limit her in a time when it was unfathomable that women would ever be ordained. She was a person of vision, imagination, and courage, a true mystic, robust and rigorous in her understanding of what it means to be a follower in the way of Jesus. Evelyn Underhill was born in England in 1875. She died in 1941. Her remarkable life as poet, novelist, and well-known teacher, retreat leader, scholar, and writer on mysticism defies all logic. In an age not unlike our own, a time of radical change, global chaos, and the rising tide of tyranny, violence, and war, Evelyn Underhill was drawn into the Christian fold as an adult, an Anglican, an Anglo-Catholic, and with astounding rigor made the case for the mystic way that looks nothing like a detached, vapid, and dreamy spirituality. She says, to bring eternity into time and the invisible into concrete expression is to see the eternal goodness in action. These are the plainly expressed desires of all the great mystics. She writes, mysticism is the art of union with reality. It is, above all else, a science of love. Is that not amazing? A science of love. One and all, the mystics demand earnest and deliberate action. The insertion of the purified an ardent will into the world of things. The mystics are artists, and the medium in which they work most often is human life. They want to heal the disharmony 
between the actual and the real. And since in the white hot radiance of that faith, hope, and love which burns in them, they discern such a reconciliation to be possible. They are able to work for it with singleness of purpose and an invincible optimism denied others. She notes, Francis of Assisi, Catherine of Siena, Joan of Arc, Saint Teresa of Avila, and saints of our own time, including Florence Nightingale and Octavia Hill. All these have felt sure that a great part of the drama of creation has been given to the free spirit of humans, that bit by bit, through and by them, the scattered worlds of love and thought and action shall be realized again as one. At the end of Practical Mysticism, she writes, this life shall not be abstract and dreamy. It shall be violently practical and affirmative, giving scope for the limitless activity of will, heart, and mind, working with the rhythms of the divine idea. It shall cost much, making perpetual demands on our loyalty, trust, and self-sacrifice. It shall keep both deep and wide, embracing in its span all aspects of reality, making the inner and the outer worlds to be indivisibly one. We are one. In her essay, The Heart of the Soul, Underhill reflects on Saint Teresa, who said, however great the breadth, the depth, the height of the soul, we shall not exceed the reality, for its capacity is far greater than we are able to conceive. And the sun which dwells in this house penetrates to every corner of it. Saint Teresa gives us an image of a house as our soul's dwelling place. And Evelyn paints this amazing and pragmatic picture, the soul's house the interior dwelling place which we all possess for the upkeep of which we are all responsible. It is in this place that we can meet God and from this place we can even exclude God. Underhill begins with a reminder that this dwelling place of our soul is not an isolated and detached estate but part of a vast organism. That even the most hidden life never lives for itself alone. Our soul's house forms part of the vast city of God and shares all obligations and advantages belonging to the city as a whole. We are bound up in a supernatural society and as much as we may believe that when we cross the threshold of our home, we are on our own, we are still part of this mysterious reality, bound up with all the inhabitants as one. We are one. For the city is built on the unchanging life of God as on a rock, the one true reality. Evelyn then describes the type of house the soul lives in. It is a two-story house. First, there is a ground floor. The natural life, biologically conditioned with instincts and affinities, and this life is very important, for it is a product of the divine creativity. Its builder and maker is God. But we know, too, that we have an upper floor, a spiritual life, a capacity for God and his reality, and this is even more important. We must learn to live in both realities, on both floors. That is part of our mysterious vocation as human beings. It is a two-story house, but we must accept the reality that comes from Genesis. We are both grounded 
fashioned from the very dust of the earth and endowed with the capacity of the supernatural life infused with the very breath of God. We all have capacity for God. If we try to live on one floor alone, we destroy the mysterious beauty of our human vocation, this dual vocation of body and spirit, a psychosomatic unity, a soulful presence and an incarnate being in the flesh. Evelyn offers this view. And so, we are ready to step into that first floor, the sacred space of the body. We begin on the ground floor, for until it is in decent order, it is useless to go upstairs. A well-ordered life, the natural life, is the only safe basis for our supernatural life. Christianity brings this unruly aspect of our humanity with it. This is the incarnation, not an empty and vapid space, but a human one in the flesh. If we do not tend to this part of our house, we cannot experience those higher virtues of faith, hope, and love. Here is the battleground for our cultural reality. This is the place where discontent and desire can run rampant under the assault of a world that says you can never have enough. Taming these desires comes with three very old-fashioned words. Evelyn tells us, prudence, temperance, and fortitude. The human power of choice must be submitted to prudence. Human impulse and desire submit to temperance. And despair, neediness, and, neediness, and anxiety submit to the virtue of fortitude. Because Christ dwells on both floors, faith, hope, and love are found on both floors. Evelyn Underhill offers us this image of the city of God and these dwelling places, these castles for our souls. Her robust vision of a life well lived continues to bless us. Though Evelyn Underhill and the vision of these seers of holiness, we discover that we are not bound to some fragile and narrow perspective like complementarianism, uh, we are welcomed into the divine partnership where all can flourish. So guys, happy Father's Day. And remember that together we, one great humanity, dwell with God. Amen.